So, warship autoloader turrets. Well, kind of were the holy grail from as long as projectile weapons have been the main system for ships fighting each other. Let's be honest. Half the efforts the Romans put into, in terms of their development of siege weapons, especially that do repeat firing, is based on the development of ship weapons, in, especially in the Punic Wars. So, honestly, this is an important thing. Why, though? Why do we seek to automate weapon systems? Why, when you consider all the effort put into developing guns, especially 6 inch and below, which were specifically as fast as they were, because everything could be done by human power, because the muscles of the crew could do the work, why are they so focused on these, you know, this, this idea of mechani mechanizing it, automating, um, automating it to extent? Well, it's because humans get tired. Yes, often the problem in battle is the squidgy organic bits. Steel can get tired in a way, it can warp, etc., due to various strains and things being put on bonnet. But often that requires a considerable more effort and a considerably more time than it does for a human to get tired after exerting themselves a lot. And yes, you can swap over personnel in a turret crew. You can have multiple people to do the jobs. And that's often one of the confusing things when you start pointing out to people how many people are needed for a turret. And they're going, but but you, you don't have that many positions on a gun. And when you add all that, to it, that's more than you have on the gun. Yes, well, that's because you have your second team, basically. And you almost are swapping the groups of people over. And on some ships, you even have three teams. Pretty much for, for the very active roles. The gunner, i.e. the person sighting the gun, and a couple of others might stay the whole time, but even then, their eyes might get tired. Now, this is something which evolves as battles go on and become longer, but also as battles sort of change and evolve. Especially once you start to deal with long-range firing, where you're really straining the eyes and making sure you've got the targets and information correct, and you're really working hard on a lot of data computation, that can be mentally very taxing. And, okay, we can sit there and go, well, you know, we're, we're good, we're, we're smart, we, we can remember it, you know. You, and, well, you can do it for the first few numbers, the first few minutes. But try making sure you're getting these numbers right for 30 minutes, 40 minutes. And a battle can go on for a long time. It could be a whole day and you need to eat, you need to drink, you need to rest, you need to go to the loo. So it makes sense to have people you can alter in. Because, think about it. Think about really needing the toilet and having to add a program in the, de the, uh, program in the numbers and the settings into a gun. They have to be very precisely programmed in. You really don't want someone who's distracted doing that. So, mechanization, automization, is all about reducing the effort of the humans to make their lives, I wouldn't say easier, but less subject to the vagrancies of being a squishy organic bit. And... The question was, how are warship autoloader turrets prototyped? Well, the thing is, they weren't really prototyped, because quite a lot of things evolved as time went on, and that's what this video is all about. It's about the fact that a lot of stuff is, is evolution, because there's a lot of systems already in place, and at a certain point you have systems, especially when you're talking about battleship guns, pretty much the humans involved are the sensors. They're the sensors. That we, we don't have a sensory system and computation system to control uh, the, the systems. You have to have someone judging it by eye and controlling settings that way. And that's a real problem as well because that changes and evolves the role. But also, you think about this, if you are judging the loading of guns, loading of a gun, a barrel, 
with the charge and the shell of the shell and the charges and you're putting it all in think about it think the ship's probably moving there's firing going off all around you days you, your ship might be being hit itself the turrets are probably moving and cycling through and so it can keep pace with the target in relation to your, uh, your own ship all these things are going on around you and you need to be able to to an extent block that out and concentrate on what you're doing because if you get it wrong if you get the charge it's in posi the wrong position if you get the shell in the wrong position it's going to completely muck up the firing best case worst case scenario it's going to go off wrong in the wrong place maybe even inside the barrel which can cause all sorts of fun tribals battles and daring well look i i realize i say this a lot but i'm an academic an independent academic these days youtube and book income is my primary income and it's January in the UK, so it's tax season. I have no idea what bills come my way on the tax, because it could go one way, which would be very good, or it could turn out that a, a employer has done the same issue they have that they did last year and not paid the tax properly, and then I get a fine. It's a joy it can work out sometimes with PAYE. Because I'm not going to get into it. But it was fun. It was fun last year. So, um, buy copies of books. <laughs> Hopefully check comes before tax bill does. <laughs> Any money left over from tax bill goes into new books to hopefully get them out as soon as possible so that I can hopefully get done, them done before we start moving the house. Although, that's a whole different fun thing. So, also load of turrets. What are we talking about? We're talking about a mechanical aid. Or a placement for the personnel that load ammunition into the crew serve weapons without being an integrated part of the gun itself. There is a difference. If it's an integrated part of the gun itself, it gets very, very strange. An autoloader tends to be a system which extracts a shell and propellant charge from the ammunition storage rack compartment and loads it into a magazine or belt. Now, this course is fun because I'm going to be getting into this in a second. And it causes real fun when we start talking about some of the ships which come later. And this, of course, is some of the testing of the lightweight 8-inch gun which the Americans were looking at in the 1960s. That's fine. You know, the, that's the scenario they're looking at there. I'll be talking about that more later. But um, smaller crew enables the turret to be smaller, first thing. It, maintenance access versus operational access tends to be a lot less space. And smaller crew also means smaller hotel load, which means you, in terms of hotel load, is what we call uh, call things the things that sustain the crew aboard the ship. And all these things start to work down and reduce the needs of space on the ship. When we're talking about the crew on a battleship, we're talking about hundreds, thousands of personnel. Anything you can do which can reduce that is going to help you. Not just with the wage bill, though that the accountants do tend to enjoy that one. But more importantly with, well, if you don't need that space for that, do you have to have a ship that big? Or do you have to, can you use the space for other things? Or can you use the weight for other things? Can you delete an entire deck, lower the ship down, and give it a thicker, tougher armour? There's all sorts of options. Now, the Gatling gun is the point at which people start to really get serious about the idea of automation of weaponry. And when I say Gatling gun, I mean in terms of autom and automation of weaponry, I'm talking about not about sort of the things the Romans have done. Because if we consider, you have the Roman period, you have China, you have a few other spaces in the world where automation of weaponry and rapid fire systems are really quite coming on. But the trouble is, in the medieval era, You have the longbow. In, and that's a problem. Because the longbow is quite so fast firing, quite so simple, that you can put it in just quite so many numbers. Then in medieval Europe, it really does, in terms of warfare, it does kind of make things complicated. And yes, 
Other countries end up go as focusing more on crossbow development to counteract the longbow, because crossbow tends to have slightly easier to learn how to use, slightly longer range, depending on the power of the crossbow, and slightly slower to fire, but, you know, it, it can work. The thing is... At a certain point, you get to the musket era, you get to developing on that sort of era, and then it's working out what to do. Several points, they're loading cannon with the equivalent of shotgun pellets, uh, shells, really, uh, in terms of firing a huge amount of musket balls. And then they get to the Gatling gun in, the 18, in 1861. They start going, hmm... What would be good is if we have this, but we could fire more of them. If we could fire a lot more. And that's where things start to get interesting, as said. Very interesting, in fact. This is not to say there weren't many that tried the Gatling approach and thought it might be a perfect idea, or variations thereof, for having rapid-firing weaponry on ships. But the trouble is... Once you start trying to apply the Gatling approach to something which can actually damage a ship, uh, <laughs> this is the small issue. Gatling gun is great if you want to sweep the decks. But when you're dealing with, I don't know, something like HMS Warrior, uh, which has about 18 inches of teak and <laughs> iron plate uh, around its central uh, section and can be steered from under the, underneath and controlled from underneath and also has pretty thick sides anyway, you find that the Gatling gun is not much help. Furthermore, she also carries a lot of guns which are going to keep you further away than the Gatling gun can actually shoot. So, it does not only help. It, the Gatling gun is helpful if you are doing boarding actions. The Gatling gun is helpful if you are in ports and you want to stop board, people trying to board you. All those things it's good for. But for ship-to-ship -ship combat, it's not really great. And trying to make anything big enough to actually be useful for ship-on-ship -ship combat, the Gatling mechanism doesn't work. So, well, Hotchkiss are a good example of a company which also gets enraptured with the Gatling idea for a while, but then they go with the quick firing idea. And the idea behind quick firing is very simple. It's the shell and the cartridge is cartridge shells. So the idea is instead of you having to load a charge, load well load the shell, load the charge, put it all in it's all in one, so it's one person and shove fire shove fire. And this is why quick firing means 12 plus rounds per minute. Because, broadly speaking, broadly speaking, this action takes time. And there's only so much space you can put around one of these guns. So you're talking about a three or four person crew manning the gun. And whilst one would be aiming it and trying to sort of fire, the rest are all pretty much to do with loading of it and swapping around. They will have various roles they supposedly do, but they will swap around to maintain that rate of fire, if they need to maintain that rate of fire. And then we have the 4.7 inch Mark I. 1885, and this is the genesis of what becomes the 4.7 inch that is the Royal Navy's... Honestly, the Royal Navy probably should have focused in on this rather than the five inch, but will uh, rather than trying to experiment with five inch, the five point two five inch, the four point five inch, you know, it's basically the British should have done with the four point seven inch. What the Americans did with the five inch, just gone right then. How do we make this work? Just concentrate in on this. It would have been fine. No, instead the Royal Navy was. When at one point they had the 5.5 inch, the 5.25 inch, the 5 inch, the 4.7 inch, the 4.5 inch, the 4 inch, and the 3 inch were all being worked on simultaneously for similar roles. And, okay, you know your organisation has gone a little bit screwy when you're working on seven different types of weapon with seven different training requirements and seven different logistics trains and seven different uh, sets of needs 
for one roll. You can maybe justify two, possibly even three, if you're upgrading older ships and, um, you know, the differing features. Submarines, etc., versus surface ships. You, you can possibly, possibly, you want to take a cruiser level heavy AA, capital ship level heavy AA versus a general purpose for a destroyer and smaller vessels. You can, you can possibly justify three, but honestly, honestly, you really shouldn't. Honestly, you really shouldn't. But the whole point about these weapons, the whole point about the 4.7 inch, is that this is incre increasingly human intensive. But as time goes on, what they're trying to do is they're trying to reduce down the number of things the human has to do. This is the first attempt at automation. The idea is to reduce the amount of things the human has to do. We don't have technology at a level that we can replace the human yet, so let's re reduce the number of things a human has to physically do. Because that all takes time, and as I've said at the beginning, humans are squidgy organic bits that get tired. Then we have the quick-firing 6-inch gun. And very quickly, they realize, when they're trying it, the quickest gu the, the largest gun they can make quick-firing is 6 inches. There is a reason why the 6-inch gun becomes so dominant. It's its rate of fire. And there is a reason why it outfires the 8-inch gun in the Royal Navy's tests, because the Royal Navy's tests are all about number of shells, volume of explosive down on target, and likelihood of causing actual significant uh, actual damage. Not likelihood of causing significant damage, okay? An 8-inch shell, if it hits, is more likely to cause significant damage than an individual 6-inch shell. But you're more likely to get hits with 6-inch shells. So you have more chance of causing significant damage. Or at least of blinding the enemy. And then you can use torpedoes. It, that's the entire scenario when you're talking about that. And it all comes back to the whole original Mark 6-inch, quick-firing 6-inch Mark 1 from 1892. The whole idea was we can do this, but the reason we can do this is because this is the heaviest round which can be manually moved around. Note that. Manually moved around. You do try with heavier shells, but you're talking about multi-person involvement. You're talking about assisted involvement. So the moment you ever get above 6 inch, you are talking about assisted involvement. And here is a good example. This is from World War One, and this is where it gets really interesting. Remember I talked about earlier about the idea of, well, it's human involvement. But how much human involvement? Look at this shell. It gets picked up. If you can see it, see in the first um, number one where it's sort of being loaded. Yeah, I think it starts off... I think I've got them a bit wrong. Right? Let me rechange that. That's better for this demonstration. So, you can see the shell is being loaded in first into the trolley, which is taking up from the magazine into the, gu uh, the gun. And as that goes up, then you get the cartridges being loaded in. And they're all supposed to be loaded through the safety mechanism. As you can see, there's the official safety mechanism, the, uh, the cylinder, which is supposed to roll through. And that's supposed to stop flash fires going off. But of course, that takes time. So what you do is you either force them open, or you have the door open next to them and pass through there. Or you stick charges everywhere in the gun, because that's going to increase your rate of fire. No, you don't do that. You don't. It's always interesting, depending on which part of the Royal Navy you're in, whether that actually happens or not. Um, you're not supposed to. This is the thing. If you're following the procedures, there is a lot of safety included in this. You can see there are doors, there's all sorts of protections which are going down. And then... It goes up. Goes up to here. Gets transferred automatically by machine from one one set of ca one carriage to another carriage is being pushed when i say automatically it's being maneuvered by actual machines not by humans pushing it if you notice the whole way no human has carried this shell it's far too heavy for humans to carry there is a tr there is a see uh, there is a um there is a track and trolley system 
the cartridges are moved by, uh, the, well, when I say cartridges, the powder bags are moved by hand, yes, between the various things, but they're relatively, compared to the weight of the shell, there is nowhere near the same weight. They are much lighter. And it all goes up, and it's again, it's machines moving it from one carriage to another, it's machines ramming it home into the gun, into the barrel. All that's done by machines. Watched by humans. So, one of the interesting conversations I've had with a lot of people is the idea that, oh, well, no, it's automation is completely not possible for battleship guns and all those big guns. And you sit there and go, well, actually, what you're talking about, the problem here isn't one in terms of technology to actually move the shells or technology to do it. The problem you've got is, A, programming in this, the gun, the angle, etc. And that's all being central fire controlled anyway. To an extent, there's a debate as to how, uh, especially once you get on to later radar controlled gunnery, etc. That all pretty much figures that one out and is controlling the, uh, the uh, sort of the azimuth and positioning of the guns. But... What mainly the humans are involved in this process are doing is providing the sensors. They are they're, they're taking the place of all the sensor systems to tell them, hang on, no, stop pushing, we're in. And, you know, trolleys arrive to do that. So at all these levels, you will have humans directing things. Humans, more than likely, picking up, the uh, connecting and making sure the shell is secured. On the trolley, and the trolley takes the shell to uh, to the carriage. All these things are going on. This is part of the process. So I would say, when someone tells me it's uh, it, it's physically impossible for them to automate these guns and etc., I don't agree with that one. I don't agree it's impossible for them to have done it. But, the problem you're looking at is sensors and how you generate those sensors, and how precise you need those sensors to be. If we were doing it today, we would probably talk about incredibly precise sensors, but do you actually really need incredibly precise sensors? Especially considering this is a sensor which, in the case of at least one of them, needs to be positioned relative to the firing of a gun barrel. So the shock and all the other scenarios of the gun barrel. You also notice that when it does fire, that second carriage, the turret carriage, is well out the way. It's interesting. It's interesting. It's all part of the scenarios and it's all part of working it through and figuring out how they can possibly do these things. But when we say, what are we therefore saying with sort of automation? We are, are we talking about reducing the humans, reducing human involvement or removing human involvement? Because to an extent you could say there's quite a lot of mechanization in that humans, human muscle power has been replaced but humans are still very involved in the process of the guns. In World War One, When we look at the 1920s, the British are certainly pushing forward on this. I have... I have an interesting perspective on the Americans pushing forward on this. I would say that the Americans would have liked to have pushed forward on this, but getting funding for it is certainly not something that's going on. I'm not sure about the Japanese. I haven't been able to... So much of their data has disappeared. And the Germans weren't, because the Germans in the 1920s are in no fit state to do anything, really. Um, and we're not going to get into the French and the Italians. The Italians are interesting, but no. The British, though, are publishing papers. They are working through papers on the automation of guns. This is something which is going on and still part of the Royal uh, Navy's process and work going up into the 1930s. When I say publishing papers... I mean literally publishing papers. Publish it, papers are being published in journals. Papers are being published in the Institution of the Works and the Institution of Naval Architects, all those things. So, these are not things which are being 
bandied around in disreputable magazines or something like that. No, these are going out in very, very much peer-reviewed. And when we're talking about peer-reviewed, when you read the transactions of the Institute of Naval Architects, you realise very quickly that they are no holes barred in their cross-examinations. I mean, y you read some of the comments and you think they must be deathly enemies, they're going so viciously for each other, and then you look up the actual details and it turns out they were best man, uh, best man for each other at their weddings, and things like that. And you're sitting there going, this is... this is unusual. The interesting thing is that they did look at it when they were talking about the F2, F3 designs. They decided it wasn't viable, which is why it doesn't turn up in the design which is used for Nelson and Rodney. But they did talk about it. It's an interesting point, because again, the idea was to try and get the maximum, the maximum... Out of the raw, knee, out of the fire ability of the uh, the fire viability of the Royal Navy's guns. In this scenario, they were of course looking at 15-inch 50s, which would have been a really interesting development. Um, honestly, these ships are a very interesting design to me, and very very interesting in their capabilities. But leaving them to one side, I think I don't think the technology was ready at this point. If we consider some of the sensors which are developed and some of the systems which are operational by the mid-1930s, it seems to me far more viable that you have suitable systems available to alternate major guns available by that point. I don't think they push ahead with it because, honestly, it was it was very, very difficult. But, again, it's one of the things which tons some, some is get it's, it's one of the things which comes about with the Lion class. Again, when you're looking at talking about them, there is something which does make me wonder sometimes if the difficulty with the guns wasn't so much the 16-inch guns itself, but the desire to try and automate as much of the firing process as possible. I'm not sure if they were going for completely automated. I don't think they were making that step. I don't want to be that ambitious. But I think the British were trying to reduce the crew and reduce the size of the turrets. And this, of course, this is an hourglass turret. And you can see all the things going on in that turret again. That there is very limited human involvement. This is not a lot of human muscle involved here. This is a lot of human brain power. And a lot of human... I would say resilience. One of the interesting things is how they are storing projectiles to try and speed up the rate of fire. And it's sort of interesting again how they're structuring the charges in the magazines. It's it's all being designed to try and maximize the speed of the firing and minimize minimize the human involvement Go, as going back here you know all the way through these guns everything has been done to try and reduce the amount of human involvement necessary in order to speed up the pace of firing because it's not about the first five shots it's about the first 50 shots and that's the thing. That's when you're talking about a, a gun rate of fire, average rate of fire, realistic, a re a realistic rate of fire, all those things which come in. You know, very Quite often, with some of the stats, you'll see ships are quoted for a certain rate of fire for their guns. And that rate of fire is guns at perfect position, is, is for some navies, is guns at perfect position being kept constant firing at a target, so not manoeuvring. When you consider the the realistic rate of fire, where the guns will be elevating and dropping down as well, necessary because they can't always be loaded at maximum. They cannot. No guns can be loaded at maximum elevation. 
So whatever their maximum elevation is, they, it's very rare they can be loaded at it. Most of them have to be loaded as near to flat as possible. As near to flat as possible. They can sometimes do a little bit either way, but it's it's not going to be much. And the bigger and more powerful the gun is, the more you have to be careful of that. Because again, some people go, well, you know, they have this as their spe uh, specified uh, facility for loading. Well, if your guns are facing this way, over your side of your hull, and your ship is doing that in the sea way, that is going to add to the angle. So, are you going to go, right then, well, I can do a maximum of uh, plus 10 degrees, so I can load at this point. Yay! How much are we dipping? We're, we're, we're dipping up and down by about 4 degrees. So, should I go with 6 degrees for loading, or should I go with 0 and hope I'm safe? You go with 0 and, and, and you go with 0. You don't take the chance. The whole scenario of a shell falling out into the sea, or maybe just going down the barrel part of the way, so that when you set the charges off, it is a bit of a damp squib and misfire, because it's not all pressed together properly, that's not something you want to really encounter. Again, one of the problems with automating the process. Post-World War II, a lot of work is done. A lot of work is done. And this is the point to which I really do believe the next generation of battleships, if they had been built, I do believe, I honestly believe if the Soviets had built battleships and the British and the Americans and the French had responded with their own construction, those vessels would have had automated guns. They would have been, they would have been automated guns. Um, the US might well have just kept the Iowas in service. But it depends how many battleships the Soviets build. And honestly, uh, the Royal Navy, even Britain even keeps some of the Lion class hulls around for a bit. And the idea of a success of the Vanguard was still being worked on up until about 1948. There's still drawings floating around. For the British, though, the big generation of automation is the quick-firing 6-inch gun, the Mark V, N5 gun. And it's a really cool system, and it, along with the 3-inch guns on the Tide class, had the ability to break itself by firing. <laughs> it was trying for such a high rate of fire in so many angles. It was... <sighs> It was something which needed to have traditional British levels of construction numbers to iron out its issues. What do I mean by that? One of the things the British had at that point still built into their construction methodology and their policies was the idea that they would build enough of a, cl enough of a class, enough examples of their weapons that the testing of the initial first two or three ships would allow them to iron out the problems in the subsequent ships and then would allow them to go back and redress those problems in the first few ships with a major refit. If you consider the town class, if you consider pretty much all the British cruiser construction prior to World War II, it follows that sort of pattern. When we're looking at the six, the twin six-inch gun turret is a really good example of this because the Royal Navy, okay, yes, neither, none of their classes are particularly massive runs of ships with the twin six-inch guns, but they build enough of them as a whole group. And of course, it starts off with HMS Enterprise having those twin six-inch guns that they are able to iron out a lot of issues and do a lot of pro uh, troubleshooting of the ships at sea. And they carry on the same with the town class and the crown colonies with the triple six-inch turrets and all those things. And then, post-World War II, honestly, 
these guns needed more testing, they needed more development, they needed much more rigorous development than they got. And it's the first real post-war lesson the Royal Navy goes through in regards to ship armament is this. That, oh, we've got... Oh, we're only building three. So we're going to have six of these turrets and zones. Oh. Yeah. That's not enough. It's really not enough. The Americans, of course, have the Des Moines class with the 8-inch 55s, Mark 16s, and they are gorgeous, gorgeous weapons and gorgeous systems. And they really do show a capability which I would love to have seen continued on. It's one of those things... Um, the Cold War has caused us to lose a lot. The Cold War has cost us reserves. It's cost us a realistic appraisal of what warships are for and what navies are for. And it's cost us a lot of heavy weapons. Which would have been very useful. All lost because, well, they weren't able to contribute to the North Atlantic fight. And the amount of times I hear the phrase, well, the 8-inch gun would only be useful for shore bombardment. Potentially. Potentially, you could have developed a very interesting shell, a, fl a flak shell, which blows up and fills up a large area with shrapnel, which would been quite useful for dealing with saturation missile attacks. Let's be honest, if you could use your 8-inch uh, inch guns and you've got two triple turrets forward, firing enough, rapidly enough, you could probably make a convincing wall of steel quite a bit far, further away from you, down a close weapon system as well. And that makes your life a little bit easier. But leaving that all to one side, why are not amphibious operations and land attack, land bomb moments, not useful things to be able to do? Not every power has missiles. And even the ones that do... Do they have anti-ship missiles with the capability of dealing with a ship fast enough, rapidly responding to it enough that you couldn't have taken out the problems before they become a problem? And 18 shells are on the whole a lot cheaper. And it's one of those things where you get into a whole debate about efficiency. A precision strike by a missile. It's clean, it's efficient, takes out exactly the target you're aiming for, hopefully minimal collateral damage. All true. But it's not... One of the things it's not is... Um, unless you're deploying a large number of them, it's not quite as impressive as, I don't know, making an entire cliff face disappear overnight. For about the cost of that missile. If you're doing things right. Um, some of the recent gun projects have been really kind of interesting on that front. But this is why I've got to talk about missiles. Because this is the point. This is where rapid fire has got us to. This is where automation has got us to. The modern VLS system. The minimal moving parts. The minimal human involvement. Humans literally pressing buttons a long way away. Computer system running it. Everything's as rapid fire as possibly can be. Minimal human involvement. And this has been the the experience for naval development and naval force generation for a long time. The idea of reducing the amount of humans involved in the loop. Because humans have to make a decision. Humans take time. Even if they do it as instinctively as they can, they take time. So everything you can do which reduces the humanity in the loop in terms of the squidgy organic bits not the decision making process and anything you can do which re reduces the amount of movements and mechanical operations in the uh, in, in the process will speed up your fire will speed up how quickly you fire a long legacy of naval history and naval warfare has been that the person who fires first, fires most, tends to win. 
because on the odds are you and your opponent are going to be able to achieve similar levels of accuracy. So what you've got to do is maximize your chances of actually hitting your opponent. So if you're both achieving a 75% rate of accuracy, uh, that's only a 75% miss, miss rate. So only 25% of your shots fire. And you fire 100 shots, and your opponent fires 300 shots in that time. Well, you've had 25 chances to hit something critical and sink them. They've had 75. Sadly enough, fortune, good luck, all those things tend to be done on the side of large armies which are well prepared, equally led, and able to outfire far greater volume than you are. It's the same with navies. Navy, the navies which, if we look at the ships and they're looking at the battles, it's the volume of fire which tends to tell. Once we're looking at actual weapons which can actually take out a ship, which is where it all becomes interesting once we go back to the whole Gatling gun system, because, let's be honest, there were some people who actually thought that they could use Gatling guns to take out ships. Not quite sure who what those people were thinking was, but the basic idea was that they would shred sails with them. Don't think you'd get in range to do that. So it's, it's always a case of having to balance that volume of fire, with something which can actually do damage, which is where the six inch gun came in. And which is where a lot of the battleship weapons developments comes in. It's the rate of fire versus the, size, uh, the, the, the power of the shell. The larger the shell you're firing, the larger the gun, the usually the slower the rate, your rate of fire. So whilst, yes, you can be a really big ship, you can be armed, let's say, with 22 inch guns but if you're only carrying six of them and your rate of fire is one round every 40 seconds in terms of realistic rate of fire which gun so you can buy a fire a salvo every 40 seconds and you find yourself against the ship which has let's say 16 14 inch guns probably roughly the same tonnage wise and it can fire two rounds a minute well whilst yes you probably might have a range advantage let's say you can fire for four minutes longer than they can fire for so you have six salvos in those four minutes Roughly. 240 seconds divided by 40, yeah. Roughly six salvos. You'll fire six shells, so you'll fire 36. And then they're in range. And they're firing 16 shells twice a minute. So in five minutes, they will have, in let's say 10 minutes of fighting time, where they weren't able to fire you for the first four minutes. In 10 minutes of fighting time, in 600 seconds, you will have fired 25 salvos, 150 shells total. That's good. And in the six minutes of firing time, they'll have achieved in the same time, they'll have fired. About 12 salvos, each of 16 shells. Now, that's 192. The longer the battle goes on, the more and more shells they're going to have in the air. If you've taken out a turret, great. They've lost, if they've got four quadruple turrets, they've lost 25% of their firepower. You lose a turret, you've lost 33% of your firepower. And the thing is, your slow rate of fire is going to count against you. 
so it's always a case of balancing the fire, the individual firepower of the weapon with the volume of firepower the whole ship. And this is where the VLS system comes in. It gives you access to all that firepower. But it does also mean that you have no magazine depth because these days we do not have at-sea reloading systems. I do realise the Mark 41 VLS, if you look at the Ticos, uh, you will see that their numbers are slightly weird. They have eighty, uh, they have eighty-one, etc. And in so, uh, in terms of eighty, they're carrying eighty-one uh, VLS in each of their blocks. And the reason is because some of their block, uh, some of their systems are blocked off for a crane system. But then you look at the Ali Burks, and they definitely don't. And if you look at some of the other systems, they def uh, the most uh, most of the modern systems, they don't, because reloading at sea was something which, again, Cold War has kind of robbed us off because the idea was the war was would go nuclear or would be you know would therefore be over very quickly, so you didn't need to worry about necessarily reloading at sea. <sighs> Joys of the Cold War. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Normally I have a question at the end of these videos. But at the moment, the question I want to ask is to do with the first video in the, naval, in the aircraft, Year of the Aircraft Carrier series. The Naval Aviation one. The beginning is the Naval Aviation. In it, I've asked for suggestions for this year's aircraft carriers videos in terms of which aircraft carriers you'd like to me to cover. There's going to be 22 videos which are about specific carriers, about their operations, about their conceptions and all those things. Basically I'm striving as hard as possible to make sure they don't overlap with the key ship series because I want, might want to do a key ships on those ships as well so at some point. So, But they'll be covering everything the key ship series doesn't normally cover. Plus probably some overlap but hopefully minimize that. And so if you want to go to that video, which you will find on my channel, Beginnings of Naval Aviation, it was published on Wednesday. That is um, Wednesday this week, which was the 3rd of January 2024. I'd love to hear your suggestions for the topics. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope you enjoyed. Thank mm -hmm. you.